Ask a Pathologist podcast. Welcome to the Ask a Pathologist podcast, sponsored by Lumea and the Digital Diagnostic Summit. The idea behind this podcast is to provide meaningful information and resources to both current pathologists, but also those pathologists just getting into the field early. Um, and what better way to get that content than from pathologists themselves? And so we're we're really excited about the guests that we have that we'll we'll introduce here in a minute. Um, I am James Thackeray, the head of Digital Diagnostics Summit and the chief commercial officer for Lumea. And I want to give, like I said, a really warm welcome. And just uh, we're so excited to have both of our two distinguished guests here today. I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves and also introduce our topic. And we'll kind of go from there. So, Dr. Ho, why don't we start with you? If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So my name is uh, John Ho. Uh, I am the program director, the Der Dermpath director of Dermpath at UPMC, and also the program director of the uh, Dermpath Fellowship at UPMC. We have two fellows a year. Uh, been here for uh, about uh, I don't I can't do math that fast in my head. But <laughs> I think it's somewhere between fifteen and twenty years. And uh, it was my first job, and uh, maybe it'll be my last job. You know, who knows. Um, but, uh, I also, um, am heavy in the digital pathology world, do a lot of research and help found Omnix, which was a digital pathology company. Um, and also the founder of, uh, Kiko stands for knowledge in knowledge out, and it's a social platform for doctors. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Dr. Pascoda, you mind introducing yourself? Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, Hi, Dr. Ho. Nice to see you here. Good to um, see you. My name is Sikriti Baskoda. I'm currently at Columbia University Medical Center as an assistant professor of both cytopathology and surgical pathology. Before this, I trained at University of Pittsburgh. I, I was once a trainee of Dr. Ho, <laughs> and this has been my second year of practice. Um, I am also a part of Kiko as a Kiko 25 group, uh, group which was founded by Dr. Ho. And I'm also a founder of uh, mastopath.com, which is a website dedicated to helping people get into pathology. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, you bet. Boy, we're excited about this. Dr. Ho, do you, do you want to introduce the topic that you guys would like to discuss today? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you graduate, when you graduate fellowship and you start your first job, there's a big, obviously a big transition that happens, but it's also kind of a perspective shift and you'll never be um, a trainee anymore. And you'll be, when you become an, an attendee, you never become uh, vice versa. When you become an attendee, you'll never be a trainee anymore. And when you're a trainee, you'll uh, never be uh, vice versa again. So um, that flip happens very quickly. And when you change sides, uh, it's very valuable because you can be like, man, I wish I had known this, or these are the things that I never thought about before. And so I thought it'd be very interesting for new attendings and old attendings, uh, like myself, new attendings like Swickerty, Dr. Boscoda, uh, and old attendings like me to kind of um, tell uh, trainees what they might not have expected uh, about uh, becoming an attending. So um, that's why I picked the topic. Well, let's dive into it. I love it. <laughs> let's go for it. Okay. So, so we each have um, three things that we thought of, and I, I don't know what Dr. Bascota's three are, and I actually have three plus one, like a bonus mm -hmm. one. So um, uh, maybe Swickerty can start off with the first one. Well, first one, I'm going to start with both a positive thing and a negative thing. Okay, <laughs> exactly negative, the thing that I struggle with. The positive thing is I did not realize the freedom that I would get as an attending. No more reporting to the attending at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. in the morning with all the case previewed. You make your own schedule. You struggle with it no matter how long you want to struggle for and come up with a diagnosis and see whether your colleagues agree to it or not. That was the best part. I can just close my door if I am st stressed out, put on a loud music and take forever to struggle with a case. That's the most um, uh, thing that I appreciated, which I could never appreciate as a trainee because I was following my attending schedule. 
The other thing uh, that, you know, somewhat I realized was it was so easy as a trainee to take leave on Friday afternoon, you know, at 12 p.m. I would just go and knock at the attending's door and say, hey, I'm going out of the town for the weekend. I'll see you Tuesday. Boom. That's it. You know, that doesn't happen anymore. The minute you switch and put on the attending level on to yourself, every case that runs by your desk is your responsibility, whether you are going to stay late Friday night or come back Tuesday morning to a big pile. That's on you. Yeah. So uh, I was going to say something very similar also for uh, my first one, which is your schedule autonomy. And this is probably one of the greatest things about pathology is, uh, you know, when you're a med student and even when you're a resident, you're like, I got to be here at this time for this lecture. I got to be here no matter what. Or somebody says that I have to be here. Somebody says that I have to be here at a certain time. And, you know, for example, we work with a lot of dermatologists and they have to be there when the clinic opens at 730 because they have patients at 730 and they have a whole bunch of patients and you can't just show up uh, whenever you want to. Now, um, this is. Uh, this world in pathology, there's all kinds of different practices. This is, you know, for example, at, at, at in the PATH department at, at UPMC, they have an overnight call service for uh, transplant pathology. So obviously, you can't be like, I, I'm not going to go in for call. Um, but uh, I know attendings who love to do uh, mixed martial arts and they train during the day and they get there at like 5 p.m. And then they sign out from like 5 p.m. to midnight or something like that. And I've known the other attending uh, other attendings who were the complete opposite, uh, who would get there at 3 a.m. because they just love getting there. At, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Bascota knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, and so they, 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 they're there at three and they leave by like nine or 10, uh, in the morning. So you have a lot of control over your own schedule. And I think residents don't understand, um, how important that is. Uh, you know, I think of the ER docs all the time where they, they go from one night shift, like four times in the month, and then they go to day shift and, or nurses or whoever, lots of people in medicine have this sort of. Uh, changing shift and and um, there's a lot of body stress that happens with that um, and there's a lot of stress when you're supposed to be somewhere and you can't be there for whatever reasons that are outside of your control like uh, you live further out and then um, you have a meeting at like e even not a ridiculous time like nine o'clock and then uh, you're like ah, I gotta get there I can't and then you're calling in and you're like I'm gonna be late and stuff like that um, you know, in pathology, you get there, you just have to get all your stuff done, uh, and then you can leave. And whatever that schedule looks like um, it is completely up to you. Now, I happen to love going into the office. I love talk talking to the trainees. I love uh, seeing the dermatologist. And so uh, I don't want to be an exclusive at-home job. But um, number one, you know, if you have kids and the kid's sick or something like that, uh, or for whatever reason, they have a doctor's appointment and, you know, you can drive them and then go back to work or pick them up if they if they're sick at work and then uh, uh, and then go back to work or work, you know, half a day at home and half a day at work, you know. So it gives you a lot of schedule autonomy. And that is highly, highly underrated. I see trainees they come out and they're always like looking for jobs. How much does it make? You know, how, you know, what's uh, how many days am I there and stuff like that. But when you have uh, complete control over your own schedule. Um, that is very, very, that contributes significantly to cost of life. You know, that, that's worth a lot of, if you're going to think in terms of how much extra do I get paid versus how much more am I going to enjoy my life? Um, there's a lot of, you know, a ton of value there. Um, and I would say with things going digital now, that gives even more power to uh, the young pathologists who are looking for jobs, who, who they have the option to either go in or do my cases, uh, you know, at home. So uh, I think this trend is going to uh, be even in more favor of uh, young people that are going into pathology. So that, that's the first thing that I would say. So we said the same thing, um, <laughs> Swickerty, but uh, Dr. Biscota, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's not exactly the same at every practice. And I think it's good that we both said the same thing as our number one, um, because it really is a big draw to uh, pathology. I, I can't believe you didn't coordinate. That was so good. I just, the, you both came up with that. And the fact that 
at least the technology seems to be even enhancing that or potentially could enhance that autonomy is such a great thing. And everybody's jealous of the radiologist forever, you know, because they've been doing things that allow them to sometimes do remote work as well. So that's exciting. I, I Anyway, I didn't mean to butt in. I just was really excited about the, the answers. No, not at all. Okay. Now it's time for the second point. Time for the number two. Let's see if these are the same between us. <laughs> Yours. Here's mine. So I never realized as a trainee, the implication of my diagnosis actually makes on the clinician and the future aspects of the therapeutics, you know. For me, as a trainee, it was enough to get to the diagnosis. But the procedure that follows afterwards, what ancillary tests to order, what the morphology might suggest in the molecular testing and what molecular findings would implicate in the patient's therapeutics. I think it was a sharp learning curve for me in my first two years of uh, practicing. And the other, which was very surprising to me, was how to phrase even the most benign and the details things correct so that the message I'm trying to give is received correctly by the treating clinical team. You know, they have to put whatever we gave as a diagnosis to the patient presentation and clinical symptoms. I think that's one of the major challenges. So I would like to suggest the trainings was towards the end of their training or even during fellowship. Try to focus on the ancillary test, make effort to go back and look at the molecular test results once they come back. I know most of our schedules are scheduled that way that we are already off that rotation when most of these ancillary tests are made available to you. On top of that, make effort to read PDL1 assays, even HER2, even the hormone receptors assays, you know, try to make a, your individual effort to report that so that you are concurrent to other colleagues in your practice once you start signing them out uh, on your own. That's a great one. Can, can I just say one thing to that? Because I I can't get, I get so excited. I've, I've watched how that works just from kind of my side of it, um, where the clinicians are driving that ancillary downstream testing, right? And they're the ones who are being marketed to by the molecular companies, and they're kind of pushing it down. But their understanding sometimes is limited to what it actually, how it impacts the full diagnosis and and obviously the therapeutics to follow. So I, it's so great to have pathologists kind of take the lead and be the experts in that whole, you know, how does this all fit together puzzle? So I apologize for jumping in, but I just, that's so well said. Sorry, Dr. Ho. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, so we're, we're going to be two for two here. <laughs> so um, what I was going to, how I was going to phrase it is that uh, I, I didn't realize how much I would learn from the clinicians from, you know, in my case it would be the dermatologist. And uh, what I mean by that is something, you know, similar to you is that, you know, their, their uh, treatment, I wouldn't say, I mean, in many ways it depends on us, but it's not, it's not, you know, a, a one way street. And um, I'm constantly finding myself asking, like, okay, if I phrase something this way, wh what what are they going to think differently? If I phrase it this way, if I phrase it that way, what what are they going to think differently, and and how are they going to approach it differently? And and a lot of times they'll text message me or they call me or whatever. Um, and so the importance of uh, number one, having that open channel between you and your clinicians. Uh, is incredibly important because they're going to save your butt sometimes and you're going to save their butt sometimes. And I always tell the trainees that the most important product that you can produce is trust, trust in you. And so you have to constantly um, uh, invest in these relationships because they're going to teach you things that you didn't know and that you never would know um, if, if you didn't reach out. And so, and they're interested in uh, what you say. Uh, you know, the dermatologists are very sophisticated about uh, derm path, and they they know what things look like under the microscope. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've even had uh, clinicians say, "Well, isn't there this rare variant of such and such?" Um, and uh, and I said, "Okay." So, um, so definitely, there's there there's clear impact there, and I and I love to learn from uh, the dermatologists as much as they. They, they love to learn from us. I can't agree with you, Dr. Homer. 
you know, when I started, I was that arrogant trainee. We just transitioned to an attending, you know, who was so confident about every diagnostic phrase I used. But when now I have like learned more from clinicians, I understand whatever I'm trying to say might not be received at the same way because clinicians are trying to put things into perspective. So I think for the first two years, now I have been losing my confidence <laughs> and maybe pausing before I actually hit that sign out tab to think about, OK, whatever try I'm trying to say, you know, whether it gets transitioned to the clinician in the proper way or not. And like you mentioned, uh, text message through, you know, Epic Chat has made so much easier, our life so much easier, even a simple message, hey, this is what I see, but I'm not definitive about this, because this is, you know, especially in cytology, we deal with so much of small scanned specimen, hey, I am really concerned about this here, but I cannot be definitive, you know, if you think uh, this is what the patient e is suffering from, please send us more sample or whatever, you know, I think that raising that gap, helps us build the mutual trust between two teams very much. Yeah, and uh, the other kind of changing dynamic right now for young trainees is that uh, there was a new law that came out that says that when uh, when a result is resulted, when a final result is resulted, the system cannot delay that the patient's access to the diagnosis. So uh, instantly now, um, you know, patients are getting a text message that says your report has been signed out. Like the instant I hit sign out, they get a notification. And most of the time, the dermatologist hasn't even had uh, the opportunity to look to, to even know. So the, the, the patient will be like, hey, what does this mean? And the dermatologist is like, I didn't even know that it resulted. You know what I mean? So wow. uh, now we have this different dynamic where the things that we um, phrase, we have to be aware that the patient's rights uh, are to have it right away. Uh, and so this makes communication with the dermatologist even more critical. Um, so, uh, you know, th that's one of the things that is changing. But, um, uh, you know, that just hammers home the point that you got to trust your clinicians and your clinicians have to trust you and you have to keep an open line of communication. And you're, you're going to learn a lot from them. You know, I see trainees come through and all they want to do is get the right diagnosis. Uh, well, sometimes you have to give people options, especially in um, dermatology. You have to be like, this is the pattern I see. Uh, this is what I favor, you know, in my number one, my number two and my number three. And if you see this happening, this something specific happening uh, clinically, then you could consider four. You know what I mean? So uh, I've come to kind of embrace in certain situations, like you got to give them options so that they can match what they see clinically with what you're talking about on path. But uh, you know, the trainees want to be like, this is it. This is the one thing it could be. And the clinicians are like, come on, man. It's not scabies. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so uh, the, the this is the art. A and you have to do things like this the same way every time so that your clinicians start to get to know what your reports. And if you miss, like I missed, uh, I asked, uh, uh, we have a quick text uh, and it le left the word conceivably in there. I always delete that word. Uh, and one time I, I forgot to delete the word and I get a call from the clinician. He, he's like, what do you mean conceivably psoriasis? Because usually you just say, you know, uh, psoriasis. And I take that to mean that psoriasis is the most likely thing. Uh, and but this time you said conceivably, does this mean that you really don't think it's psoriasis? So that, you know, they really do pay attention to the reports uh, and how you write. And uh, just kind of as an, as an aside, my um, high school English teacher um, who was very good and very well respected. Uh, he said in his class, English will be the most important class you ever take. And uh, I was like, no, what about all the discoveries that come out of math mm -hmm. and science and this and that? And uh, it took me really like 20 years to figure out that writing is how you communicate. And if you don't communicate clearly, um, there is going to be problems. And uh, so, so uh, these are two long-winded ways of uh, saying that uh, you know we, we we learn from our clinicians and we 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 try to communicate as best as well uh, as best as possible to to establish trusting relationships. I love it. I'm just curious. Uh, have you changed your like especially approach to giving a unexpected diagnosis on a Friday evening after the changes that happen where patient gets their report immediately? We haven't changed anything um, yet. Uh, you know, I, I definitely support 
the, the patient's right to have instant access to their information. Um, I, I definitely think we need to talk to the dermatologist uh, to see where things could get screwed up. And, uh, you know, for example, that, you know, that's one of them, you know, it might be that we always, if there's something unexpected, we always, you know, try to get a hold of them, you know, as we're signing it out or something like that. I don't know. We'll just have to talk to them and, and see, uh, what the best way for both the, the, the clinicians and the, and the system are, but, um, it's definitely something that we need to adapt to. Yeah, I agree. So communication, trust, I mean, the, those are the the staples to a good relationship with your clinicians. And I've watched pathologists like yourselves who have that relationship where the clinicians just start to trust more their expertise, even downstream into the ancillary orders and all those things and start to, hey, you may know more than I do in this subject. Please advise, you know, you, I've even watched, you know, the way they they turn that back over to pathology um, anyway, that that's awesome. Great, great stuff. Okay, now the third one. Um, the third one. <laughs> okay, don't say the same thing, Doctor Ho. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, people will really think that we actually get our notes with each other. Okay. Well, I still also I still have a, a also a bonus one, so uh, we're for sure not going to be the same. <laughs> okay. Sure. But I also think that you will agree with my bonus one, but we'll see. I'm sure. I will. <laughs> okay. My last one is, you know, my training uh, in my perspective was comprehensive and made me a competent pathologist from a day one. But I think, you know, billing and compliance is one thing that was never emphasized throughout my training. You know, now I realize when I'm an attending what, you know, I need to report each and every immunostains I order, whether they are non-contributory or it did not work due to the lab failure, I need to specify or need to put a proper billing code. And this is more important. And I think we need, we all need to talk about it more, given the, you know, recent Medicare pay cuts and everything. We need to be sure that our, uh, our revenue is being re generated in the way it is supposed to be. Uh, in throughout these two years it, uh, at Columbia, we do our own billing code. So I have been efficient and prudent about which billing code I should be using, how frequently should I use, you know, but it was stressful when I started the transition of a trainee into an attending where it was one more additional thing to address and keep in mind of. But I'm, help I'm thankful for my billing team who keeps on reminding me with their nicely phrased email at the end of each month. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know how many train, I, I didn't know this when I was a trainee, uh, but if you don't bill properly, of course, you know, you, you might not get paid uh, properly. Um, but uh, if you bill improperly, so, so one thing is not billing something and the other is not billing properly. Like if you don't bill properly, uh, you and, and let's say you have a, bill, a billing team that does this, which you know most institutions do. Um, the there are there are penalties for this sort of thing, and there there are legal penalties. You know, besides just you know that that you did it wrong, we're not going to pay you. Um, uh, in in some situations, um, if you don't do it right, that could be fraud, even though you didn't intend to deceive anybody. Like if you if you bill for something that you weren't supposed to and you had no idea and, and it was all done by somebody else, but it's under your name, you are still responsible. Um, you, you know, the, the 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 university, you know, has some responsibility, too, and things like that. But uh, you are equally responsible, probably. You know, I don't know the exact letter of the law. Uh, but, uh, when, when I tell this to trainees, they're always like, but I didn't do any of it. You know, I don't, I didn't, I didn't do any of the billing. I it doesn't matter. You know, that's just the way the system is. Uh, you, uh, one way or another, uh, are going to be on the hook, uh, for everything. <laughs> um, so, so that wasn't my third one. Uh, so, but, but I completely agree with it. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, my third one is something that I've seen a lot of young pathologists struggle with and some, you know, uh, some, some older pathologists too, or veteran, you know, longer, more experienced pathologists. 
uh, who may or may not have gray hair, you know, who knows, <laughs> but, um, it's that nobody is 100% perfect. I mean, it's impossible. Uh, the best pathologists in the world do not have a 100% hit rate. And I, you know, I, I've seen, um, diagnoses that were a little bit wrong, uh, and it doesn't matter. And I've seen diagnoses that were a lot wrong and it did matter. Um, but, um, what I think that, so I I've seen a lot of people who have loved pathology and then they got out to be an attending and all of a sudden everything changes and, you know, they start sweating more because it is maybe, you know, they feel too much responsibility and they can't, uh, yeah, they, they, they have a real hard, they, they, they really emotionally struggle with what if I was wrong? What if I was wrong yesterday? What if I was wrong earlier this week? You know, and I've seen some pathologists come in on the weekends and, and look at all the cases again, just double check. Uh, uh, and sometimes people can't let that go. What if I was wrong last month? What if I would? And then this, uh, the more you practice, the more cases you have to be wrong and it just kind of compounds. And so, yes, we have a lot of schedule autonomy, but probably the thing that I've seen uh, young pathologists struggle most with is uh that um i i just can't deal with not only um may i have been wrong before but i'm gonna be wrong again in the future at some point because i can't be perfect from now until uh the end of time too so um you know it just kind of snowballs in our minds like what if i'm wrong and somebody dies you know and 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 i'll just feel like crap and i won't be able to get over it and and what if i'm wrong again after that and so um that's the struggle now you can deal with this uh struggle in a couple different ways one you can just accept that you're not perfect and try to do everything you can um to to catch mistakes uh that happen whether they were your fault or whether they weren't your fault you know you have to have a good system around you and, and they've studied medical error and usually at least two things go wrong before something you know really goes wrong so if you if, if you have a safety net to catch things, uh, uh, you know, whatever they happen to be, you know, you have to have a system that's designed uh, uh, for that sort of thing. The other way to kind of deal with it is the wrong way, which is to be kind of cavalier. And some people come out and, and they're already cavalier and they're like, I'm not going to make a mistake. It's not going to matter. And then that's the kind of pathologist you got to watch out for. Like those are the really dangerous ones who who uh, who, who are overconfident. Uh, and so I think there's an appropriate level of paranoia. <laughs> um, and over time, uh, and this goes along with the establishing your reputation thing, you know, over time, if you're like, well, um, I haven't killed anybody yet, so uh, I must not be doing, doing too many wrong things. And, uh, you know, the, the counterpoint to that is not a counterpoint, but the, the, the corollary to that is that in, you know, in academia or probably all practices, the, the longer time you go without screwing something up, the more respect you, you you get. So like when you when you started as attending, it doesn't matter if you went to Harvard or wherever or you, did, you got all these trainings, MD, PhD, uh, you're nothing. Uh, you're not trusted until you're kind of a known entity. And the only way you can get a known entity is to establish a history of not screwing them over. Um, so so that's that's my third one. I cannot agree more to that, Dr. Ho. In the beginning, I was so paranoid. And, you know, like you said, I would go back and look at the same slide thousand times before I, I before I read my report thousand times and hitting that sign out tab, you know. And, and to, in my experience, if you have some mistakes and somebody points, points out it to you, sometimes, you know, they won't be too polite like you would expect. And that hurts you even more. And your ability to become a successful pathologist I also went through some sleepless nights when I learned that, okay, I need to develop a method to better train myself and my eyes. I had printed a shit of things that I want to do before I hit up the sign out tab for the first month. And I think that helped me a lot to be methodical and not miss few things that were that I was missing in the beginning of my sign out. Even now, it has become like, a, you know, um, a header in my pointer in my back of the mind itself when I'm looking at a complicated case okay I need to write in the diagnosis I need to make sure it is millimeter and even in the synoptic it is millimeter and not centimeter or otherwise because those are the most commonest mistake you will make and that has a huge clinical implication like 
cancer is one millimeter away from the margin versus one centimeter away from the margin. So these are the few things you want to double check. And to minimize that, maybe you just want to use one uh, way to measure either millimeter or centimeter and stick to it. You know, don't change it. And uh, same way, if, um, like for cytology, it is too tedious to go from one end of the slide to another end. So always make a rule. I'll start from the left and go to the right or vice versa, whichever you are adapted to and stick to that no matter what. So great. Sorry, I and just get it. Just so a, great. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Ho. Yeah, just one more thought to add to that. Uh, I, I forgot that there's one more possible response to this kind of stress uh, is that you you leave everything wishy-washy you're like it could be this and it could be that it could be benign and it could be malignant or it could be and uh that's probably the worst thing for the clinicians because they're looking for you to give them some guidance and if you give them a report that gives them no guidance um then uh they you can't build a trusting relationship uh that way and and, and i've seen uh people do that sort of thing too I agree. That's that's great. Recognizing it's this isn't an exact science. And I think sometimes, you know, people certainly outside of pathology are like, oh, they gave me this diagnosis and it, it is exactly this way. And recognizing that that even tr your training, wherever that that's a variable in the standardization of whatever your uh, field of study might be maybe a little different than than some other academic institution. So it's not standardized fully across the board, and it's not an exact science. So knowing that going in, but doing everything you can to 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 perfect your trade as much as you can is is great. Sorry, I just wanted to interrupt and say that. I don't know why, but I did. Yeah, no, no <laughs> I understand. So I have a plus one. Um, I don't know if you have a plus one, Dr. Bascota, but I have a plus one. Go ahead. Yeah. And I can, I will try to match up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this isn't actually a plus one, but it's a subtraction. So, um, I, uh, I've heard many, many young doctors, uh, you know, after they, they finish fellowship and the, they're in training right now, uh, they get their first paycheck. <laughs> I know. Very recent. <laughs> they, they get their first paycheck and they're just in shock. Uh, they're they're in shock by, you know, I thought I was gonna make this much money, but my paycheck only says this much money. Uh, and then they see the tax uh that gets taken off. Uh, and they, you know, I, I've seen more than one uh, new new attending go to the 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 admin to be like, I I think you didn't pay me right, you know. And, and the same story every time is, uh, uh, nope, that's just taxes. That's and, and they're like, wait a minute, you know, how can this much? How, how can I be taxed this much? It, it can't be right, uh, but it's always right, and so. So that's something that uh, young attendees are never, ever prepared for because they're like, I'm getting I'm paying more in taxes this year than I got paid all of last year. Like that does that's, you know, even if you if you you logically know that emotionally, like uh, it, it, it's a big like, I don't even know what what, what to call it, but it's it's a big surprise uh, and, and you don't really know it until you. you. So it's a good problem to have. Obviously, uh, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but it still um, takes some time to sink in. I agree. I kind of had a sense that you're going to talk about <laughs> finances. <laughs> I'm glad I actually guessed it right. But I just want to add one thing to what Dr. Ho is saying, which at, at, at least being an uh, international medical graduate immigrating to this country, I did not know about, you know, there are ways where you as an attending also are even hitting the high tax bracket, there are tax savvy ways where you can invest and make um, achieve the financial freedom in your years to come. Probably when you are starting in the first few months, it is overwhelming to go through everything. But at least when you settle down and you feel like you are doing okay with your job, take some time to read about um, the financial advices. Uh, for me, the first step to that was my husband, of course. Uh, he helped me maximize my retirement account. But after that, I started reading White Coast 
investors and even Bogglehead uh, Wiki, which has been really helpful for me to make my own choices, what I want to do with my uh, remaining after I spend a ton and sop enough. <laughs> Not kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone Pleaser, but I just mean to say that if you want to achieve your financial freedom later on in your life, try to understand the financial um, nuances associated with it. And that's how she ended up with a Ferrari. Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Long way to go. <laughs> oh, so great. Well, wow, this has been great. Any last thing that you want to add? This is this is so good. You know, I could go forever on this. This is awesome. Yeah, I think we could go forever too, but I wanted <laughs> to just kind of boil it down to the the top three. Love it. And so, so um, I, I think those in my mind are definitely the top three, and, and I think that'll give uh, young trainees uh, a lot to chew on. Right. I agree. I totally agree. Well, you both are great. We're so excited that you guys would take some time to kind of be with us today. Um, we definitely would like to have you back on. Uh, I think both of you could help us understand some of the newer technologies, especially on the digital side. Certainly, we play in that space and we understand that fairly well, but but it'd be great to get pathologist perspective on the role of artificial intelligence as it comes in, digital pathology, the benefits. So we'll tee that up for another time because I think both of you would have a lot to offer on that side and certainly would be important for those getting into the field of pathology to better understand and what it is and what it isn't and some of the challenges that that probably are there. But we'll save that for another time. Well, thank yeah, you both. Sure, I'd be happy to be back. Yeah, that would be, it would be thank great you. to have you both back. Um, Dr. Biscotta, thank you so much. Dr. Ho, you guys are great. We we really appreciate the time and honestly would love to have you back. So we, we'll we'll ping you soon for a date to get you back on. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. We'll see you. Tune in next month for our next podcast. Thank you to the sponsors of our program, our listeners, and our guests for making this possible and for your support.